Hi, my name is Matthew. Um, I work at Netflix, uh, and I've been there for about two years. And since I joined, I kind of worked on this project. I'm going to describe some of the tools we do. All the stuff I'm going to show is all open source uh, accessible. So other than like how we use it, like all the pieces you see, you can go find and reuse yourself. Um, so I work on the big data and uh, big data platform team, uh, which is basically uh, works on back end tooling to help support other teams. Uh, particularly we're on the orchestration team, so we deal with scheduling work, um, and you'll see why that relates to this in a second. Um, you've got my info up there. Um, last time I like didn't check my Twitter for like a week after I did the talk, and then a bunch of people asked me questions. I'll be better this time. So, <laughs> um, so one thing I get asked a lot when I used to give you know conversations about what I do is, okay, well, what does a data platform even do? What what, what is their job? Um, and this is important to set context for like how we use this and why. Um, so here's kind of like, if you think about like end to end, like you have data inputs from different sources from users, events, system metrics, uh, whatever else you get your, your, your data from. Um, and most people's jobs are actually to just, you know, convert that data to some outcome, a report, a data model, tell somebody yes, no on a business decision. Um, but to do that job is kind of hard. That's why we're all here. And uh, the data platform team tries to make that easier for people. So we're like an adjacent team of many people who try to build tools to make ETL and machine learning easier to do. So you don't have to think about uh, the low level things or the integration parts as much. And you can think more about what your actual job is. Um, so the open source projects I'm going to talk about today cover in, are in Jupyter and Interact are the orgs that have them. Interact is just kind of like a, a branch of projects um, which adds some extra flavor things into Jupyter and has some kind of experimentation um, modules for different ways to approach Jupyter notebooks. And um, myself and some of my colleagues contribute to all these projects. Uh, I'm on the Jupyter core team and uh, Interact, uh, I would guess, a development group as well. And we do lots of open source communications, so if you want to get involved with those groups, it's really easy. Just reach out. I can help point you in the right direction. All right, uh, show of hands, how many of you know what the difference between a Jupyter notebook is and a Zeppelin notebook? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think I've ever had more than like 5% or 10% of the room raise their hand. So let's talk really briefly about what a Jupyter notebook is. So this is like the classic Jupyter UI. Uh, you see it like has these cells. And basically what that is, is the Jupyter is a... Uh, an ecosystem of tools that allows you to exec programmatically execute this kind of REPL-based code. So it's a collection of cells, and each of the cells have code or text or displays in them that then you can execute to render uh, a result. And those kind of like, you can run them linearly. In Jupyter, you can run them non-linearly, which sometimes gets people into trouble. Um, and that will save a file. In Jupyter, all of that works through a protocol pattern. So Jupyter has this like, API spec that the back end and the front end are isolated from. So when you do an execute call, you actually are sending a message to execute some code, and it's almost like you were typing on a REPL, execute this code. So, um, other notebook systems are more integrated, so they'll be more like the execute and the front end are all coupled together in one tool set. So Jupyter is more extensible, um, but it does mean it's a little more complicated, uh, which kind of deters some people from getting into it, but it means it's much easier to build extensions others can use inside of it, which is why we kind of dived really heavily in the Jupyter ecosystem back a few years ago. All right. Um, I kind of talked about some of this, but like what is it kind of, why would you use a notebook or what's in it? Well, you think of it like a rendered REPL uh, where you have a command line interface, you would type some code. Here you have um, your code, your logs, the documentation about your logs and the execution results kind of all in one document. It gets saved as one object. It's visible as one object in your browser uh, or in other rendering uh, mediums. And it's really useful for iterative development, for sharing results of what you did, uh, and for integrating various API calls. So like on the right is like an example, you load some data, you do some model iteration. Matter of fact, I think all the talks I've seen today have a Jupyter notebook like running whatever example they have. So it's really good for talks and things like that. Um, and you can display results and you don't have to change pages. You don't have to like jump between different code scripts. You can kind of just all show up in one place. Um, a little bit if you've never used them before, there's a couple like useful features to see. There's usually on whatever UI you're looking at, there's a status save indicator about how often recently it's saved. There's a code cell, which has the code you actually want to execute in a block that you would run at one time. Um, there's usually an output section displayed below about text, the logs, and the visualizations. 
Um, and you know, it makes it very easy to share. It's easy to read. Uh, you get documentation with code. It has a lot of like nice advantages. Um, it's also multi-language. So that's one of the differences between Jupyter and other systems. Uh, in some cases, Jupyter defines a kernel spec. It actually isn't specific to Python, even though Python has the best integration with it. So there's lots of kernels for other languages. There's even like some new ones, like some C-sharp ones there out there now, and Scala and some others are getting some better ones too. Um, and how, how does it actually execute is important. But if you think about it from like a kind of what's doing what, uh, your user, as a user sitting in front of a computer, you're basically talking to this Jupyter UI. There's many different Jupyter UIs because it's an API protocol. You can implement your own, so there's many out there. Um, and that's going to talk back to some server that you know hosts those APIs and responds to them and re uh, reflects the request to the actual execution. And then the, that's going to save your result to some file that's usually an IPMYB extension. Um, and it'll forward request this thing called a Jupyter kernel. Uh, and the kernel is actually the thing that does the computation. It, it knows how to actually execute the commands in that language or that framework. So if you have a IPython kernel, it is the thing that hosts a Python process and the kind of kernel receiving endpoint that will take the execute request. It'll take the like, what can I call requests and things like that and translate to a, a JSON request response back and forth. All right, so uh, what were some of the use cases for notebooks? And um, we'll get into this why it kind of expanded from where it started. For a start, it's kind of like a, or exploring and prototyping. A data scientist, you oftentimes have very expensive computation you need to do, and you don't know what you need to compute after that. So you, you, notebooks are good because you can take a cell, collect all the data you need, and then try something in the next cell, and then try again and again and again without having to recompute everything beforehand. So it helps your kind of dev life cycle go a lot faster when you're exploring something. Um, this means that you have quick iteration cycles, expensive queries you can do once, you can record the outcomes, and it's kind of easy to modify it in place and you kind of get your job done without thinking about how long is it going to take for the download that gig again. But it's not all good. Uh, <laughs> there's trade-offs to this uh, working environment, which had a lot of kickback, I think, initially when notebooks got introduced outside the data science community. Um, they're, they have a lack of history, so like if I save the notebook, make a change, save the notebook, and I forgot what I changed, you might be out of luck. Uh, they're a little difficult to test, so there's not a place to put a unit test. So when you want to productionize things, you sometimes get some friction about how do I productionize this notebook so it can actually be reliable and other people could use it. Um, the document is mutable, so you're always, there's not like a immutable record. There's some tooling that helps with these things, uh, but this is like the state of the world maybe a year ago or two years. And it's hard to parameterize and live collaboration, just don't do it, it doesn't work. Um, they're, the only tool that really does it right is Colab, or uh, not Colab, um, uh, what's that? No, Colab took it away. <laughs> Colab used to have it and then there's a, an academic tool that I'm blanking on the name of, uh, CoCalc uh, has it as well. All right, so paper mill was actually invented to try and fill some of these like negative gaps. So this is a, a library. Um, and when we started working on this, we kind of wanted to preserve the good things and improve some of the not good things. So we wanted to preserve the results linked to code. So you wanted to have like what happened right next to the code that executed it and know those things together. You want the visualizations there as well. And you want to make it really easy to share your results. So if I run a notebook, I want to give the resulting outcome to somebody so they could either re-execute it or view it or, or see what I did. Um, the things we want to improve were notebooks weren't versioned. So we wanted to kind of introduce something to help with that. Um, the mutable state problem where your notebook was mutable, so you never really knew what you actually did when that outcome was produced. Uh, and we wanted to help make them templatable so I can make one Spark notebook and I can just tweak it a little bit without rewriting the notebook in order to execute many different like Spark jobs or something like that. So we made this library called Papermill in the Interact org. Um, and effectively what Papermill does is it takes a notebook as an input, it parameterizes it with a set of JSON parameters, and then it runs that notebook, monitors the execution just like a run all cells would in your UI, and then it stores that to a different place. So you can specify the output location independent of the input location. And so you'll get kind of a direct record of what happened in that one run as a backend executable. You don't need a UI or a front end or any JavaScript to actually execute the notebook in this case. You can run all purely in the uh, paper mill Python library. So what's this kind of look like in Python? We're gonna show a little bit of code. Can anyone see that pretty well? It's okay. All right, good. 
Um, so here it's actually a really simple interface. You import paper mail. Uh, you do this dot execute notebook, you pass in the input and the output, and in this most simple case, you will run that and produce an outcome. So here you can see, maybe I would be iterating through days I want to run, and I would run the input notebook and just say the day I want that I ran it for as the name, in the really simplest way to sort of give a per day execution version. And then I put that someplace, uh, and if I listed all the files in that directory, you know, I would see uh, that I have a run for each day, and I could kind of just see what happened. If you wanted to parameterize a notebook, say you have this run, but you really want to like give it some inputs to narrow what it's executing, maybe it does something like, I don't know, count the number of viewers on different devices in some region. So you can specify, oh, filter, they're just California, and only do phones and tablets. I want to know about those instead of other things. Um, then you can pass those as parameters, and they will get mapped into the notebook. What I'll actually do inside the notebook is that JSON will get converted to code. So below you would see what... Um, if I had this kind of a default value in the cell number marked as two with a region US and device PC and some date calculation I did, when I do the execute notebook, it's going to inject another cell after that one that was tagged as a parameter cell. And it's going to convert your JSON into code of region equals California, device equals a list of phone tablet. So it can convert any JSON into the language code of your kernel. And then when you execute that notebook, it just happens to be right after the default values, and so it'll overwrite them where they need to be. And that's how it actually uh, parameterizes. All right, so you can also do this from a CLI, which is actually how it's most commonly used if you're not writing extensions. Um, you can write the uh, uh, execute notebook from Python. You can also just use the CLI and say paper mail and give the input output and then your standard kind of uh, command R options for all the things you could pass into execute notebook. Here we do dash P for a primitive um, parameter, dash Y for passing YAML, which is a superset of JSON. So you usually just use that to pass a JSON blob of whatever you want to pass into the notebook. All right, let's hope the internet lets this play. Cool. So you can see when you're running the CLI, um, if I'm in some project and I have this notebook basics, IPMIV file, I can just say paper mill and be basics and execute this and then you'll see how it actually works by default. You can control a lot of the outputs and what it logs to the command line. Uh, there's lots of options there. Uh, but here by default, it's gonna kind of do a progress bar and tell you what the input and output paths are gonna be kind of as more informative for a human. Uh, you can change this to be more machine readable if you want. And if you pass parameters, you can just, you know, say we wanna set the, the conference to be PyCon. Tell all when I made this video. <laughs> And yeah, so it rerun the same one. It added an extra parameter cell because we actually passed parameters. So now there's two different outputs. The first one we ran and the second one with our extra parameter has different outcomes. And we can go read those files independently and the input wasn't touched. Uh, if we do something very equivalent with Python, it looks very similar. So say I have a notebook here. It, this is the notebook I'm actually gonna execute. It has an image that it prints called uh, the paper mill logo, and it adds some strings together to see how you spell paper mill. Very complicated example. Um, and if you just run the import paper mill, execute notebook, it's going to look very similar. And it has nice uh, notebook support, so it gives a nice like rendered bar that actually updates in place. Um, and then you can do the same passing parameters and it works all the same way. So it's a very simple interface to use. Um, it's meant to be very, um, like, easy to drop in and just replace an execution, much like you would execute a script with saying Python script and then passing args. And that'd be the outcome. So you can see we injected this mil equals mil2, uh, and then just paper plus mil became paper mil2. So how's this changed the kind of paradigm of executing a notebook, which used to always be uh, back many years ago, just running from a server? Well, now we can actually run, uh, we can read in the notebook, instead of a uh, UI running the execution management, paper mill is managing the execution, um, and it's writing to a unique output instead of writing in place. Uh, but under the hood, it uses a kernel manager the same way the Jupyter server would, and it talks to the same exact kernel in the same exact way. So from an execution and backend point of view, it's executing just like a user opened up a notebook server instead of run all. And, and then the only difference being that we capture the output and put it someplace else instead of mutating in place. Um, a little more detailed if you want to see like what that actually looks like internally. The code base isn't very deep. Um, uh, if you read it, it's only like a couple thousand lines of code, and almost all of that is actually connecting to other um, resource locations like S3 and Azure and things like that. 
Um, so here you can see we have like the notebook source and parameters of the inputs to our paper mail function. Uh, the runtime manager is, is basically initiated by paper mail, which actually exports that to from another library that already had it implemented. Uh, and then it uh, monitors the runtime process and kind of extends the other uh, default behavior for some paper mail specific things like injecting in metadata about the execution time and errors and catching them and doing kind of quality of life improvements on, on the results. Um, and the other thing you can do here, which I haven't talked about much yet, is your sources and your syncs can be basically anything. So you can register schemes with paper mill you don't, by writing an extension. Uh, and then it, it will be able to read from that scheme and pull from RDSs or uh, from S3 or from Azure or from some other exotic place. Um, and it can also write to those places. So you can basically give it um, paths that uh, it let you look in deeper into other systems that you already have without having to like manage copying files from your other system into your local and context. Um, some of these that are built in by default are Google Cloud, Azure, S3. Um, I think there's one or two more now these days. Um, it's really easy to add. So if you have another one you want to add, it's quick to add a PR. And extending it's super, super easy. Everything in the whole repo is plug and play. Let's say we wanted to add SFTP. Um, this is all you need. <laughs> so you make your SFTP handler with a read function and a write function. It has to have that signature. You then, in your own project, you don't have to do it in paper mail, you use um, the entry points. So you set up tools and you add an entry point and you just register this paper mill IO. You register the scheme um, on the left and you put the class name that you're going to use for that scheme. And then you can then use it inside anything that has that package installed. And now SFTP works for input output. So, all right. So, you know, given this is the library and the tool, and how is it, how do you use this to productionalize notebooks? And what do you need to think about when you're using this tool to kind of use a real business use case? So, um, notebooks in production is kind of a sticky topic. There's ways to do it that will let you in trouble, which are really obvious because there's this mutable state object. It's highly shareable. It's not necessarily controlled in version control by default. So there's some things you'll want to kind of do above and beyond what notebooks give you out of the box to sort of kind of use them in production. And there's a number of companies doing this now. So it's not just Netflix these days. Um, so like I kind of tried to boil down some of the learnings in the past couple years of what people have done and what, what has helped make an operationally smooth process. So um, definitely add markdown comments cell to the top of your notebook. Explain what the notebook does, how it works. If there's something complicated, put a markdown cell in there and make a nice little document inside your execution. So when someone else reads it, they know what's going on without having to leave and go someplace else. Um, write data integrity notebook or a cell possibly if you don't want to write a whole another data check. When you're doing ETL, I can't stress enough, like auditing your data is super, super important. It isn't any different when you're using a notebook versus using a script or a SQL statement to do that execution. You still want to audit your data. Notebooks do give you the opportunity to audit within the notebook, um, though we tend to not do that very much because you couple the ideas together. So it's hard to restart just the audit part uh, automatically. So we oftentimes um, build workflows where the first part does a notebook to execute something and later is something that audits with either a notebook or some other tool. Uh, to get check the data integrity before it releases that data to everyone else. Um, and writing an integration test, or three, is a really good idea. So notebooks are actually really easy to integration test. They're just hard to unit test. So if you think about a notebook as a good way to write an integration tool, um, and you write tests against that integration, you can actually get pretty high reliability that it's going to be working as expected. Um, also, you know, with writing those integration tests, I put all these things into your Git repo. Put your notebook, your integration test, and any ske like scheduled definitions, put them all as close as you can together in the same repo. It helps with the co-location of like what you're doing, how you're doing it, and how you prove it's right. Um, we tried to emphasize this, so we made our scheduler have a declarative definition with YAML of how to specify your um, how to schedule this thing, and your notebook's right next to it, and your tests are right next to it. So put things together, uh, and also like reference the SHA that you executed when you do things. And that can be really valuable for kind of audit traceability, and you'll make a lot of your system platform data, um, data engineer tool teams a lot happier, <laughs> speaking as one of those tool teams. <laughs> um, you definitely want to also like set up CI tools and builds. Most ETL pipelines already have these. It's really easy to add another one. We literally just added a runner which said run paper mill on a notebook 
and that notebook happens to be a test against the other notebook. So you can kind of set something up where I'm going to do the runner as though if I were a system or a user executing this template or this ETL code I've written, but I'm going to parameterize it to put things into a dummy place. So we'll run all of our templates and all of our code that we can. We'll write it to the MSEAL database instead of the um, you know prod database, and then check that the data there is seen and prove that your kind of end-to-end -end integration works. Um, this saves you a lot of pain. It won't save you for like little data errors you might have uh, at runtime, but there's other solutions for that that are more ETL based and less on the execution framework. Um, I can talk about more of those after the talk if you want to come find me. Oh, uh, last thing too is really handy to save your paper mail outputs that you do to some place that's automatically accessible to your users. So either landing it in their mounted file share so they can get to them or to wherever their notebook server is, or even better, we map it to S3 and then put uh, view only render on top of that so that the users can see uh, what the results were without being able to edit it easily or at all. So that way they can see what happened without touching the actual execution. And then we let them copy that to their workspace. So you always get copies of things and the notebooks are always immutable everywhere. That helps a lot with visibility. That's probably the number one thing that people have appreciated in using notebooks in our ecosystem is the fact that there's these immutable records of what happened and I can just click a button to copy and rerun and then rerun it in my local dev. And I don't have to ask anyone as a developer, how do I reproduce what, what went wrong at you know one in the morning? Um, the other thing that's been really valuable that we've had a lot of uh, positive outcomes from is templatizing the common patterns. So let people write their notebooks, uh, and if they're scheduling them, if you see common ones or ones people do a lot, try to trans like bring that into a central team and have them like build a like professional version of that or, or a shared version of that. So make templatized patterns, make that easy for people to add. At this point now, we have like a half dozen teams contributing new templates all the time now to our central place where we have the like blessed templates that people can pull in and we automate more and more things around it. So we pull documentation automatically from them to generate our docs. We um, put all our tools, like know what notebooks are in that repo and automatically build bindings to like just reference, I wanna run a Presto job. Well, you just have to say type Presto and we know there's a Presto notebook that does that. Um, and then also uh, a fun thing you can do is if you tag cells, you can add cell tags and that's really handy for kind of convention based uh, like self-documenting. So we'll do things like if you want to have something that makes it to the auto generated docs, just add this tag to a cell and we'll put it in the doc site automatically. So you just write your docs in your notebook and we'll put it so it's visible on the kind of guided tour. All right, so if you want to see what one of these templates look like, I dumbed one down a little bit to remove the internal imports that don't matter to you, but this is like 80% of what our actual template is for running Spark. Um, one thing you'll notice is that we didn't actually put any real logic in here. This is like very much a template to integrate and just says like, here, I right, give me the inputs. I will apply them in some schemed way. I'll maybe do some asserts for things that should be there. And I'll give you nice error messages if you have the wrong thing. And then I put all the complexity in a library down below. So we have this Spark submit job class that kind of knows how to translate arguments to the actual Spark cluster. And the users don't need to know that. And so we make that, a, that's a well-supported library that was already there. Uh, we just built a template to integrate with that library in a nice way. Uh, and at the bottom, we kind of split up cells for like one to initialize the job, so it prints out what the job shape is gonna be, and then one to say uh, what the, when execution starts, that it's started and what its status is. And then the final one, when it's all done, print what the final outcome was, and we kind of just pull until we get there. It's really handy, you can kind of see incrementally as it's going. Uh, and even while it's executing, you'll still get saves as every cell completes to the uh, output location of the notebook. Um, I've kind of hinted at this, but notebooks, you probably shouldn't think about them as libraries, which I think is a common mistake that's been made. If your notebook is many pages long and has many different functions in it, it might not be a good candidate for scheduling or automating. It might be a good exploration for what you want in your library. Um, so treat, treat notebooks where they really shine in a production setting as an integration tool. If you have it as a library, maybe use it as a learning for what you should bundle together in something that's versioned and packaged. Um, notebooks haven't solved that problem. I don't know if they're aiming to, uh, but that's just something that if you avoid doing that, you'll save yourself a lot of pain. Uh, and it's not too hard. Usually your team already has a packaging solution uh, for those types of things. And usually it's shared code. It puts you through some rigor to write some unit tests and some other things that are probably a good idea for anything that's worth sharing. Um, yeah, so they're unreliable when they get really complex because 
you know, if you don't have unit tests on those functions, you know, how they're going to behave is going to be more unpredictable the more you have. Um, some development guide that's fallen into that is keep the low bran uh, branching factor, the simple, better, um, and keep the one primary outcome. Another common mistake they'll have is they'll have one notebook that uh, builds the feature model, like does the looping over all the possible features, does out a shell process, comes back, builds a, a data model, runs that data model on production data against 10 tables, and then prints out the result of all of them, right? That might be a good end end experiment, but you don't want to schedule that because how can you, you can't run individual parts easily. You need to run the whole thing and the end would be kind of a monster. And it makes it really hard for someone else to adopt it. Like if I look at a notebook and it's got 50 cells in it, I'm going to be like, well, just tell me what this does because I'm not going to read it. And your coworkers that come in are going to do it too. So be nice to your coworkers and try to follow these. All right, so notebooks and DAGs. This is how we also kind of apply a lot of value. You know, if you're going to break up these really complex notebooks in the units of work that make sense, much like you would like a function or a library service, um, you need to be able to iterate over them. So if you're doing that same fan out over some parameter that we were just talking about, you might have a notebook which sets up the initial data of what you're going to fan out over or does some prep work. And then you might fan and do some repeated work over and over and over again. So you can use things to build into a DAG and execute a DAG. Lots of schedulers do this. So open source tools like Airflow and um, like old school like Uzi, all those things will um, let you do these types of patterns. Um, and then you can execute those. And what we actually have done is we've made every one of those nodes just into a notebook. And so the outcome, the user can always see the result as going to the notebook link. They never have to know what type of job it is. They can always go to that notebook. Um, you know, if you were to do this in an ETL, what would ETL be in this space? Um, you would maybe have like a dimension table insert, and then you need to update everyone who is downstream of that dimension table. Maybe you would iterate through, you know, the partitions of some table that need to be updated. And I would say for each of those, I'm going to do the fact join against the dimension table and like build the new partition with the updated information. Uh, and there I can like fan it out. And if one of these fails, I can just isolate and work on it on its own. And I have a notebook that told me how it failed. I could even test it out locally until I got it right and then rerun it. Uh, and that's a really handy, like, usability tool to, to pull out when the user wants to know, like, well, this failed. Um, in today's world, before, without, like, a central template that's easy to reproduce, when something fails, they almost always have to get support. So if that fails at, at like, 3 in the morning, you have to page someone. They have to wake up. They have to then get like actually wake up and figure out what the problem is, help you reproduce the issue or isolate the problem or tell you what you need to do. So this saves a ton of, ton of time for us, saves a ton of, ton of time for our users uh, and makes kind of for some better, like smooth ETL pipelines. So I'll show you some like how we do, you know, if you want to do testing on, on a notebook. So we'll do uh, like controlled integration tests where, you know, we're going to run our template and we're going to see, you know, how many users we have on Luna. Uh, which, by the way, is a pretty small number. I hope it's zero. Might not be. Maybe that uh, crashed moon rover is sending messages. Um, so you're going to do some fake data, some fake region, give a fake date. And you, you oftentimes will do things like add a debug true or dry run flag into these templates. So it's really easy to kind of run and see what it would have done without actually doing anything. Uh, and then basically this would be the same template the user would run in production, but here the parameters that get injected are very, you know, specific to this debug. And then we kind of, you know, outcome like what would be the SQL you would run instead of actually running it or run it where we're targeting dummy data that we know won't hurt anyone if you do something bad. Uh, and you can just basically write that and produce an outcome. So I talked a little bit about failed notebooks. Failed notebooks are really key um, because they're actually a very useful unit of work about what happened. Uh, and a record of truth of, of the execution. Someone can go back and reference that over and over and over again. They don't have to worry about logs that are going to be scraped up or deleted or moved to another place. It's all collected in one place if you log your outcomes in it. Uh, and that one object is like uh, a very good source of truth for what happened. Um, so I'd say like one of the big value adds here is not the happy path, but the unhappy path in your kind of ETL. It helps kind of smooth that over and let your users be more self-productive. Um, and I kind of talked about this some, but like you get stack traces, uh, the code segment that can be rerunnable. Um, the execution logs are actually even better than logs and files because they're broken down by what cell created them. So if I have like 10 cells that are doing things, I can jump straight to the cell that failed and just read the logs of that cell first and just see the stack trace of that part. And I don't have to scan thousands of lines until I find the log that was associated with the thing that failed. So that kind of saves some time for like ease of mental exercise of finding what went wrong. 
Um, and so oftentimes our users will go find the issue. They'll test the fix by cloning the notebook, tweaking whatever the input parameter was that was wrong or the code execution that was wrong, try running it in their dev environment, prove it works, maybe even hot fix the data right there. And then when they've got it all right, they will you know, check that change back into their repo or their schedule and kind of move on with life and not have to involve very many teams. So we basically add notebook isolation uh, with immutable inputs, immutable outputs, parameterization of notebook runs, and then configurable sourcing and syncing. And this just gives a lot better control flow for notebooks as um, like cells to execute your actual ETL work. Uh, and we've had a lot of success with this. I think it's been like valuable. These are the things that were good that came out of it. We tried many things. Some of the others were maybe not as good um, or are more specialized. Um, there's lots of other ecosystem goodies. I'm not going to go through these right now. Um, they're in the slides, and also if you go to those open source projects, you're going to see lots of them. There's tons and tons of other tools to help solve your micro problems around notebook uh, ecosystem. Uh, there's MBConvert, which actually is the engine that runs paper mill uh, execution above. Uh, Commuter is a read-only renderer. Uh, bookstore is a S3 persistence for your checkpoints when you're doing uh, live devving, all those type things. Uh, and some of these, I'll leave the slides here. I'm gonna do a lightning talk, I think, later on Scrapbook, so I'll skip over that and show you it later. And Commuter's a read-only interface. It's a little bit, you know, the like two companies that are using this very heavily have branched away from the open source one, so it does need some love of somebody wants to kind of try and help come back in and update that to uh, keep it up to date and have nicer features. Um, that would be awesome. Um, and one final note before I go to questions, uh, if you think like, is this vaporware, is it really being used? We moved all the ETL at Netflix onto this pattern. So like there are tens of thousands of jobs that run every day and those tens of thousands of ETL batch jobs all run on top of notebooks, even if the user isn't aware of that anymore. Um, because if they use one of our notebook templates or they use their own custom notebook, we're able to bring users who were developing notebooks closer to their ecosystem about rewriting code, and we were able to get everyone else into the same pattern. And now everyone expects it to be a notebook link when something fails so they can go look at what happened. Um, we made it more consistent for all our users. And it's worked out really well. So um, at least for us, this was a success. Awesome. So I think we've got about like five minutes for questions. Well, because the, so the, by default, almost all the tools uh, pretty print the JSON. So the diffing, or the question, by the way, was when you're saving to GitHub um, and you get diffing on your source of truth, what do you actually see with notebooks between two changes? Um, and the answer is because it get pretty prints, the diff actually looks okay. You still have to read JSON, though, especially if it's lots of changes. So there's some other tools. Um, MB Dime has a differ, and MB Viewer has a plugin for GitHub that's really nice. And there's a couple other options out there now. Stash is a little bit bucket, a little further behind, but they just made an API change like a month ago or so that allows for that same diffing in Stash. Uh, just no one's done the integration yet. So that, that story is getting better. Can you take two notebooks as uh, inputs and stitch them together? The question was, can we take two notebooks and stitch them together as an input? Uh, no. <laughs> um, if you wanted to do that, you would have to do your own custom logic. The tooling is there to do that if you know what the business logic is. But generally, we try to keep it simple, stupid, so that you can't make as many uh, self-inflicting wounds. Is the parameterization uh, more intelligent than just, OK, here are the three parameters. I'll find the first cell that has these three inputs and uh, parameterize them right below that. What about derived variables and things like that? Yes, the parameter. The question was, how smart is the parameterization? Is it, is it just put it at the top, or is it try to be really intelligent? It's pretty dumb. Um, what it looks for is the rule is if it finds a, the first cell that has the parameter tag in it, it will inject the parameters in the next cell. It will not check what they are. It doesn't know if you did anything else. So it's up to you to make sure you're lining those two up. So the discipline is needed on the developer side to make sure you have two derived variables. In Yes, so one of the things around derived variables, probably want to do derived variables in a cell below your parameter cell so that you overwrite the default base raw values before you do the derived computations. Yeah, that's usually what we do. You saw in there we had like Spark pulling out the script below in a different cell. 
Can you suppress code w while generating outputs? Can you suppress code when generating outputs? Yes, there's a few report, you can do dash dash report mode when you execute and that will hide, It'll not all UIs respect it, but most of them do now and if they don't, they'll catch up except maybe classic. Um, they'll hide the code cell. So there's a tag that hide the code, the input or the output. That'll probably be more standardized next year. There's like three metadata tags different people came up with, but there's some push to combine them. Dash dash report mode. Uh, the question was, uh, when using cloud vendor integration, does Papermail do the pickling? So Papermail verbatim just send the JSON document. It doesn't do anything else. So whatever is in the JSON document that would have been saved if you did control S, that's what it's sending. So if you have data you're saving, um, you do want to like save that someplace. I would also be, one thing I didn't warn about, um, Scrapbook is a repo to try and help with this. Uh, but don't uh, save really, really big outcomes in your output of your cells um, because that makes the JSON document very big and JSON's not exactly the most compressed format. So if you get too big, like above tens of megabytes, you'll start crashing browsers. Realistically, you can get higher than that, but on lower end machines, you'll crash the browser. Paper mill will be fine though. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so the question was, is this maybe not a good choice for jobs that produce lots of heavy graphical output? If you have really giant graphs you're rendering in a lot of places, you probably want to think carefully about that or, or yeah, possibly not use the tool for that specifically. Um, but many times you might be running into the uh, single outcome rule that I put in there because if you're making many, many graphs, then maybe you're visualizing too many outcomes in one place. So if you broke it up a bit more, that might be a way to approach it. Um, Bo, most visualizations aren't too bad. They're not that big, actually. If you had a ton of them, you would get to that size. But most of the time, like you're doing a, a matplotlib, they, they don't take very much space. Do, do you guys use this internally? <laughs> do you guys use this internally as like a replacement? Can you or do you use it for a replacement for daily reporting, like a Domo dashboard or a Tableau or anything like that? Yeah, so um, in that sense, some teams do, not everyone. There was an effort maybe two years ago to go in that direction and start implementing it. Um, and then there was kind of a reorg and a reprioritization internally for us. So it stopped kind of pushing on that effort, but some teams still went with that even without us pushing. Um, it can be used for that. I would say you need some quality of life on some of the UIs to make that nice. So like the hiding inputs and some of the other things. Interact was a, an attempt to build components to build UIs to do that. So there are some companies using the Interact front end components to build reporting UIs out of notebooks. So the notebook will land in that and they'll choose what to render and what not and use the components there. So it lets an app developer build something around it. Um, for simple things, like it's just for me or a few people, or I don't care if it's not the most perfect representation, it is a very quick way to do a report. Um, I would say our like um, machine learning is much more like, users are much more likely to be able to report in notebooks because they know them. Um, the users who are in Tableau just already knew Tableau and didn't want to learn something new. So there you'd have to kind of do a push if they already in an existing tool. But if otherwise, yes, it does work and some percentage of our users do use it that way. All right. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. I appreciate it.